Good evening and welcome to NTD UK News. I'm Stuart Lees and here are today's top stories. A gunman killed five, including a three-year-old girl in Plymouth, before turning the weapon on himself. Detectives are yet to find a motive. Italy sees record temperatures as hot air from North Africa bakes southern Europe. But it will take more than a heat wave to stop tourists enjoying the delights of Rome. And we hear from a British firm that is revamping failing high streets with multi-story entertainment venues. Will we replace clothes shopping with buying experiences? A man suspected of killing five people in Plymouth before shooting himself is named as local Jake Davidson. Devon and Cornwall police confirm a three-year-old girl is among the victims. Officials say it's not terror-related. Entity's Trevor Piper brings us this report. Among those confirmed killed, a three-year-old girl. Police say the suspect is 22-year-old Jake Davison. He shot five people on Thursday evening before turning the gun on himself. Just weeks before, he'd posted a video of himself online saying he felt defeated by life. A shock for the community. Officers arrived at the scene within six minutes, including both unarmed and armed officers. It is our understanding, and I can confirm, that a man known as Jake Davison, aged 22, had murdered a woman at an address in Biddick Drive using a firearm. He said Davison murdered a 51-year-old woman known to him before killing others, including a young girl, and injuring two local residents. The shooter was a licensed firearm holder. Mr Davison then left that address, entered Biddick Drive, where he immediately shot and killed a very young girl. He also shot and killed the male relative of that girl. This was a truly shocking event and was witnessed by members of the public. A motive has not yet been identified. The suspect shooter posted multiple videos of himself on YouTube. Weeks before, he described being defeated by life and felt his life amounted to nothing, apparently blaming his problems on not having a girlfriend. In what appears to be his final video blog, he said he likes to think he was a Terminator. YouTube confirmed his account has been removed for violating policies. Local residents expressed their shock. Obviously, it's quite close to home, so which is quite frightening. So, yeah, scary. One of Plymouth's MPs described the shooting as one of the darkest moments in many years. Now, clearly, there is a lot of work to do to support communities who, who uh, watched and, and saw some horrific incidents unfolding on their doorsteps um, yesterday. Uh, there's families at the centre of all of this and uh, we'll do everything we can to pull together as a city uh, to support those um, who need it and uh, uh, deal with what is, you know, one of our darkest days for many, many years. Home Secretary Priti Patel praised a quick response from local police. She said the firearms licence will be reviewed. When it comes to firearm licensing, that is absolutely what the police oversee. And clearly, I will be asking questions, um, definitely in terms of local policing and raising this with the Chief Constable. But I think right now, the tragedy happened last night and there are a lot of issues, implications, lives have been lost, people have been murdered. This is absolutely tragic and devastating. And for the entire community right now, this will be deeply shocking. This is the first mass shooting in Britain for 11 years. Trevor Piper, NTD News. Italy's capital, Rome, is sizzling in extraordinarily high temperatures due to hot air from North Africa. But tourists are still in high spirits and finding ways to cool down. And today's Eddie Aiken has the story. Italy is baking in sweltering temperatures, but it's not deterring tourists. On Thursday, the capital, Rome, reached 39 degrees Celsius. Tourists are trying to cope with the heat while enjoying the beautiful landmarks. We are going around sweating a lot. It was just uh, a challenge to keep us to keep us hydrated while visiting all these beautiful, beautiful places around here. Tourists queue at the drinking fountains known as Big Noses that constantly gush fresh water on thousands of street corners. 
fans spraying water cool off those waiting to enter the ancient Roman amphitheater. This tourist from the United States carries a mini fan with her. For everything, because then you have to wear these, so it's hot, it's, it's, yes, but we're still out and enjoying what Rome has to offer. After months of lockdowns and travel restrictions, people want to return to normality. Many Italians chose Rome as their holiday destination. It's a strange summer, but we always have the desire to travel. Our children had to stay home all winter because of COVID-19 lockdown, so now we're doing everything to make them happy. The Italian Health Ministry issued its highest heat warning for eight cities along the peninsula, including Rome. Two relief stations were set up near the Colosseum to distribute water to tourists. We have distributed about 100 water bottles boxes so far. We will continue until 15.30. On Wednesday, a monitoring station in Sicily reported a 48.8 degrees Celsius temperature. Local authorities believe it's the highest in European history, though this still needs to be verified. The latest heat wave across southern Europe is caused by an anticyclone named Lucifer, fed by hot air from North Africa. Eddie Aitken, NTD News. Britain's high streets are seeing record levels of closed stores and empty units. One firm is replacing failing retail shops with department stores of fun. NTD's John Robson has more on this. Shoppers return to the high streets, now restrictions are lifted, but many notice something different. At Southside Shopping Centre in southwest London, the old Debenhams is being transformed into a multi-storey entertainment venue. Michael Harrison is Chief Growth Officer at Gravity, the company behind the project. I'm actually stood in what was the, the makeup counter uh, of Debenhams. And, and look, this is now a department store of fun. The £6 million development is the firm's biggest yet, covering 100,000 square feet. It will provide 150 jobs. There's room for 1,000 visitors to enjoy electric go-karts, bowling, mini-golf and e-sports. The space available for, for gravity um, in, in days gone by was typical 20,000 square foot units. You just couldn't find these spaces on the high street, which is why a lot of leisure is out on the, the outskirts of the industrial units. Harrison says entertainment venues are great for shopping centres and landlords as they increase footfall. The shift is part of a growing trend. Leisure and food experiences are taking the place of traditional retail. But you can't consume experiences on the internet, you, know, you can't purchase them, so you have to go out there and actually experience them you know, in an environment, be it a retail environment or a town centre. But entertainment venues won't work everywhere. Those without high footfall will have to look for alternatives. But that's only in a few locations, you know, maybe 20 locations around the UK sort of would conform towards that. The rest of them will have to change radically. And I think, you know, those locations in particular, the smaller high streets, will be very different. Harrison has plans for another 10 large scale UK locations. Offering something different to the customer base is what's key. We put our shutters up here at Southside and people gasp. People gasp and start taking pictures of what's in here. Time is, is now to change. We need to put more effort in to get people offline and come and have some fun. According to the British Retail Consortium, one in seven shops across the UK remain shut. Almost one in five shopping centre units now lie empty, leaving many thinking it's time for something a little different. Joanne Robson, NTD News. Analysis by Migration Watch finds around half of births in some of England's major cities are to mothers born outside the country. Foreign-born mothers accounted for 57% of births in London, 50% in Manchester and 42% in Birmingham. The UK's foreign-born population has doubled since 2001 from about 4.5 million to 9 million. The research says immigration has had the largest impact on Slough, with more than 62% of births in 2019 to mothers born from outside the UK. The think tank says there's a growing divergence in population between urban and rural areas, with populations in major cities on the rise. 
And in other news, wildfires that swept over the Greek island of Avia also destroyed beehives and pine trees. Producers of prized Greek pine honey say beekeeping on the island cannot survive. And today's John Robson tells us more. This beekeeper laments the loss of his trade, collecting Greece's famed pine honey. Wildfires had swept over the northern half of the island of Ervia for nearly a week, raised the land around his village. Villagers like him were torn between saving their property or their livelihood. We tried to save the hives, but first we tried to save our houses. Unfortunately, we could not save our hives. You see the destruction. Only 30 out of his roughly 130 beehives survived the fires. More worryingly for the island's beekeepers, the fires killed not just bees, but wiped out the trees they depend on to survive. There are no flowers to give pollen, so the bee population cannot be reborn. There are no pine trees to make honey, so beekeepers cannot make an income, so beekeeping cannot be sustained on Evia. Greece is the European Union's eighth biggest honey producer, thanks to its Mediterranean climate and a heavily forested landscape. Its high-quality honey is particularly prized. As fires across the country began to recede, the Prime Minister announced compensation this week to help communities rebuild. Aid will be more generous than ever. It is for all the victims of the fires, particularly for Evia. Northern Evia can make a new beginning. But for Varkras and many of those affected by the fires, the help does not go far enough. Beekeeping is over. The issue is not if they will give you compensation and it will lessen the destruction. We are not concerned about money at the moment. The destruction is immeasurable. He said he's also concerned about the oncoming winter. Without trees, rains could cause floods and landslides. Joanne Robson, NTD News. Amazon Studios today revealed the second season of its multi-million pound Lord of the Rings TV series will be filmed in the UK. This will be the first time the fictional Middle Earth moves out of New Zealand. And today's Eddie Aiken has this report. New Zealand's rolling mountains, lush meadows and forests may be famous as the backdrop for the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit film trilogies. But that's not enough to entice Amazon Studios to keep production of its Lord of the Rings television series there. The studio announced on Friday that the second season of the multi-million pound production will be shot in the UK. Moving Middle Earth out of New Zealand for the first time, despite the first season being filmed there. Amazon says it's a move that aligns with the studio's strategy of expanding its production footprint and investing in studio space across the UK. The New Zealand government says Amazon is spending about £335 million filming the first season of the show. The studio is expected to produce five seasons, making it the most expensive TV series ever. The epic fantasy plot will take place thousands of years before the events narrated by J.R.R. Tolkien in his books The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. Amazon Studios says the TV version of The Lord of the Rings will launch in September 2022. Eddie Aiken, NTD News. And in Ukraine, people are reconnecting with medieval life. A cultural festival sees them sailing ancient boats, donning traditional dress, and even challenging others to a duel. And today's John Robson brings us this story. Rock. 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 No, this isn't a movie set. In Ukraine every year in August, fans of the Middle Ages can step back in time during a history and culture festival. For a week in the Lviv region in northwestern Ukraine, participants fully immerse themselves in the day-to-day -day of medieval life. They live in tents, dress in medieval garments and learn traditional crafts. This participant says he believes the festival is an important way to connect with the country's history. We feel like people from the past. Until a time machine is made, this is the only one way to get back to the past. Some watch or even take part in night duels. 
Our equipment is created for a sport fight. We do not want to have any serious injuries or fatalities. During the reconstruction of a historical war, there is different equipment used. And on the river that runs through the city of Rin, every year in August, medieval-style boats set sail. Participants have built the boats themselves using traditional techniques. Oleg brought his vessel to the festival. The ship has been made based on the technologies from the past. We are using metal made by our hands. We also made ropes ourselves. Finally, we put everything together using pine tar. The same technology was used like in medieval times. The annual festival is a way to reignite an interest in old traditions and ways of life. Joanne Robson, NTD News. Still to come, one month after devastating floods in Belgium, efforts are picking up pace to rebuild battered towns. But residents say they expect months of disruption ahead. Then and more after the break. As the Taliban takes control of more cities in Afghanistan, the European Union tests high-tech border control equipment. Greek's migration minister warns the EU does not have the capacity to handle another major migration crisis. Ajit John Robson has the details. The EU's border agency Frontex is trialing high-tech surveillance equipment in Greece to detect migrant boats. Rapid gains by Taliban fighters in Afghanistan have raised the prospect of a surge in people fleeing to Europe. We are observing and following the developments specifically in Afghanistan and Tunisia, which might have an effect on the migratory flows in, towards the European Union. A mix of cameras and thermal vision sensors give a real-time view of a 40-mile circle of sea, covering 15,000 square miles. More than 400 Frontex officials are stationed in Greece, the front line of the migrant crisis. Greece is actively protecting its external borders. It's not only our borders, it is the border of the European Union and we're working together with Frontex in preventing uh, illegal entries into the European Union. Having said that, we do have sufficient capacity at reception centers to address any pressure we might face. Several EU countries have stopped forced returns of Afghans due to intense fighting. But the Greek migration minister sounds a warning. The EU is not ready and is not, does not have the capacity to handle another major migration crisis. And we see that in the reaction of most European Union governments. Nearly 23,000 migrants were caught illegally entering the EU via the Western Balkans from January to July. As fighting in Afghanistan intensifies, EU countries are worried about a repeat of the 2015 crisis when more than one million people entered. Defence Secretary Ben Wallace says up to 600 UK troops are to be deployed in Afghanistan to help Brits leave the country. On Friday, the Afghan government confirmed Kandahar, the economic hub of the South, is under Taliban control. Downing Street announced the Prime Minister would convene an emergency COBRA meeting Friday afternoon to discuss the situation. Joanne Robson, NTD News. Four weeks after flooding swept through southern and eastern Belgium, killing over 40 people, residents are busy rebuilding their lives and towns. But some say they expect months of disruption are still ahead. NTD's Costa Menes has more on this. One month after devastating floods in Belgium, residents and volunteers say efforts are picking up pace to rebuild battered towns. Some lament the slow start to recovery efforts. We have to admit that unfortunately there was a delay in the response. First of all, it was the individuals who were on the ground who provided assistance. Flooding swept through parts of southern and eastern Belgium in mid-July killing 41 people and leaving a trail of destruction that cut power supplies and swept away whole houses. 
A dozen buildings collapsed in the eastern town of Pepinster. Residents were evacuated from more than 1,000 homes. We need to find as much housing as possible for the victims whose houses have been pulled down because they have been declared unstable by experts. Power supplies have returned, but gas supplies are not expected to resume until the end of the year, leaving many residents heading into winter without heating. Now we have to start rebuilding, equipping the houses, electricity, wiring. Electricity meters have been reinstalled, fine, but we are nowhere close to normal. We are nowhere near. This restaurant owner in Liege launched a soup kitchen for flood victims. They have lost their cars and do not necessarily have the money to buy household appliances. So yes, food aid is helpful. I know people need it. Having said that, I think we should now empower people and allow them to re-equip themselves so they can cook. It includes a delivery service. Some residents say the disaster has also taken a mental toll. We're not really feeling good. We are a little on edge. The morale has taken a hit, and that is hard to handle. We are afraid when it starts to rain. We tell ourselves that the water will rise again. We are afraid that the buildings will collapse on someone walking on the street. This kind of thing. And some say they expect months of disruption are still ahead. Costa Menes, NTD News. The Swiss embassy in Beijing recently called on Chinese state media to remove what it called fake news. Several Chinese media quoted a Swiss biologist called Wilson Edwards on the origins of COVID-19. The Swiss embassy said on Twitter, the embassy of Switzerland must unfortunately inform the Chinese public that this news is false. It said Switzerland has no citizens named Wilson Edwards and there are no academic articles in the biology field under this name. In one report from China state-run TV channel CGTN, Edwards is quoted as saying he is worried about the independence of the World Health Organization and that investigating the origins of COVID-19 would become a political tool. Edwards' Facebook and Twitter accounts have since been deleted. A popular caffeine-free alternative to black tea recently received European Commission protected status. It means only products grown in certain parts of South Africa can use the name Roybosch. It's been a 10-year battle for Roybosch, also known as Redbush, to get on the protected list. And today's Trevor Piper brings us this report. Roy Bosch or Red Bush recently became the first African food to receive protected designation of origin from the European Commission. It took more than 10 years of negotiating for Red Bush to get on the list, joining Champagne, Irish whiskey and Manchego cheese. This means only Roy Bosch grown in certain parts of South Africa can be called Roy Bosch, which farmers hope will boost demand. Just like Champagne is unique to France, so too is Roy Bosch in this area where it traditionally grows, making it unique to South Africa, especially this area in the Western Cape. Luxury London store Fortnum & Mason has offered exotic products since 1707. The company's tea expert says although Roybosch has been in the UK for 20 years, the European listing should increase sales. For us, it's all about the provenance, and Roybosch has a fantastic, you know, has a fantastic story. I mean, if you've been out to see where it's grown in in, in Cedarburg Mountains, it's it's really hot, sandy. It's an amazing looking looking bush. Roybosch is is fantastic. It's 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 got this wonderful, soothing, calming um, flavour to it, quite sweet. The broom-like plant, commonly drunk as tea, has grown in popularity due to its alleged health benefits. Only 70,000 hectares can grow Roybosch, and they've been hit by successive years of drought. If we, if we do have a product with uh, more value, it means that the farmers can invest more in sustainable farming. And that means uh, looking after the soils better um, and uh, looking after moisture conservation better. There are around 350 commercial Roybosch farmers. The industry hopes to attain similar protections from the World Trade Organization. Trevor Piper, NTD News. And finally, a new scientific report suggests Neanderthals had a fondness for creating art. Based on cave paintings found in Spain, they may have been closer to our species of prehistoric modern humans than previously believed. 
And today's Cost Terminus has the story. Reddish brown pigment discovered on stalagmites in the caves of Ardales near Malaga in southern Spain created by Neanderthals about 65,000 years ago. According to a study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences Journal, the find possibly makes them the first artists on Earth. There are always red marks made with iron oxide, applied with fingertips or with an airbrush. The dimensions they have are relatively small, sometimes they don't reach more than 20 square centimeters, and many of them are simply punctuations made with the fingertips. Modern humans weren't around during the time the cave images were made. The new findings add to increasing evidence that Neanderthals were not the unsophisticated relatives of Homo sapiens, as they've long been portrayed. They became extinct about 40,000 years ago. Pigments were used in the caves at different times, up to 15,000 and 20,000 years apart. They dispel an earlier theory that they were the result of a natural oxide flow rather than man-made. These type of red marks that are in these folds are those that have been dated at more than 45,000 years and less than 65,000 years, and those to which pigment analysis have been carried out, which has shown that the type of dye applied is not natural, but a recipe that has come to the caves thanks to human contribution. Dating techniques show Neanderthals had spat an earthy pigment made of natural clay and sand onto the stalagmites, possibly as part of a ritual. I believe that this art made by the Neanderthals will be in other caves. It is very clear to me because this type of non-figurative art appears in many international caves. Wall paintings made by prehistoric modern humans, like those found in the chauvet pont cave of France, are more than 30,000 years old. Costa Menes, NTD News. That's the news for today and thanks for tuning in. I'm Stuart Lees. Thank you for watching our daily news show on YouTube. You can also watch our other programming on channel 190 on Sky TV or on Freeview via Channel Box on channel 271. In the meantime though, please give this video a like and hit subscribe to our channel. Have a good day.